Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carolyn Anger, and I'm the president of the Toronto chapter of ACED. Thank you for joining us today for our July ACED Toronto chapter event. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but first, I would like to tell you about some exciting ACED news in case you missed it. ACED is launching its flagship certified e-discovery specialist exam and training program in Canada. Initially, ACEDS will offer a beta exam through August 31st with substantially discounted rates for the training and certification exam. The beta exam is the final critical step in the development of the SEDS Canada exam. Beta exam participants will take an extended time exam with 100 to 60, with 160 to 170 questions. Once the beta exam closes at the end of August, the results will undergo full statistical analysis. At the completion of the analysis, questions for the final exam are selected and a cut score will be set. Beta participants are graded using the same questions and passing scores as the final version of the exam. The beta exam is necessary to comply with industry standards for certification credentialing. This Testing of the test will ensure that the SEDS Canada exam meets the same high standards ACEDS has set for the SEDS certification over the last 10 years. For more information, visit the ACEDS.org website, and I will also place a link into the chat for everyone to see. If you have any questions or would like to join our Toronto chapter, please send an email to toronto at aceds.org. And in just a minute, I'll turn this over to Andrea Williams from FTI to kick off today's webinar. But first, I would like to take the opportunity to thank ONA for generously sponsoring our event today, building a proactive e-discovery plan for cloud apps. And as always, we have to have a disclaimer keep all of the legal professionals happy. Speaker disclaimer, all views and opinions expressed by the participants in this presentation belong to the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the organization that they work for. There will be a live Q&A at the end of the session, but if questions come up in the meantime, please do enter them into the Q&A box. After introduction by our esteemed panel and moderator, you will hear about the rise of cloud collaboration apps, common challenges, e-discovery planning, as well as some closing considerations in Q&A. And now onto the show. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Andrea Williams, who will be leading today's webinar. Andrea, take it away. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks everybody for joining us today. We're really pleased to have you here for this conversation, of this very relevant conversation. I'm Andrea Williams. I'm a managing director with FTI in the technology segment for Canada. And I have worked in the e-discovery industry in Canada for 16 years and in a variety of roles and, and organizations. And I'm really excited today to, um, to be moderating this discussion with Sean and Scott. So I will uh, throw to Scott McVeigh. Hi, thank you. I'm Scott McVeigh. I'm the industry principal uh, with ONA. Uh, and for 25 years, both uh, in in-house roles, uh, as well as as a consultant, I've been involved with e-discovery, privacy, and information governance, sort of like records management. Uh, challenges for both clients and organizations that I work for and helping to put in uh, the strategies to solve for those. So, Sean? Hi, I'm Sean Bugler. I'm a cloud architect with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. We're a government agency based in the San Francisco Bay Area here in the United States. Uh, my job is to take all the different cloud-based services and platforms that we support as an organization and tie them together in a way that makes sense. Before I did that, uh, I worked as a technical trainer and consultant for Fortune 500 companies and startups to help them bring their cloud architecture uh, and their cloud services to life. So a lot of experience with respect to implementing these tools and of course, working really closely with our friends in legal to make this make sense on both sides. Great, thanks. 
So we're going to start talking a bit about the rise of cloud collaboration app applications. As everyone knows, over the last year, it's been it's been a challenging one, and uh, this has forced many organizations to have a rapid migration to collaboration platforms so that we can to enable their workforce to transition to be productive at home while still working remotely with collaboration and communication capabilities. Now many organizations are faced with the downstream implications of these changes. And as the data growth, the location, and the control governance and retention all comes under the microscope. Scott, what are some of the main challenges that you're seeing and how can eDiscovery help solve some of these challenges? Well, that's a, that's a great question. And I think one that we're, we've all been grappling with, right? I, I think when you look at the, the, the growth rate here um, and First of all, I think all those IT departments did a great job of trying to get the tools in people's hands so that they could still be collaborating and working and productive while we kind of worked in a safe environment and, and, and kind of tried to get our arms around the pandemic as much as possible. However, what didn't happen, which would normally happen with the rollout of these kinds of tools, was the change management and you know the training aspects of what do we want to do with that tool and, and how to put good governance in place. and and how to understand where that data may live and what are some of those other challenges. So the, the cart got a little bit in front of the horse in terms of like technology got way out in front of the people and the process and the policy piece. So I think when you think about like e-discovery as a, as a function, um, not just like as a technology, we're really good at finding data, right? Like, so now we've, we've what we've done is we've created all these other little buckets where people are working and collaborating and data is living there. So I think e-discovery has a role to play in helping to kind of map that data back to the organization of, hey, did you know that we're using these applications to support all these other processes? So I think there's definitely a role there to, to, to help kind of get our arms around that. Great. And speaking of buckets, we have a lot of different buckets and every organization has a unique set of buckets of tools and data and the resultant data um, for each organization and residing in more places than ever before. So e-discovery professionals are really challenged more than ever for on that front end identification, preservation and collection exercise. Um, and they really, we really need to care about the, not just the legal event, but also potential, uh, like how to how to share this with our clients too, around the bigger picture findings and to, to really maximize the value and minimize the risk going forward. Uh, Sean, what are, what are some of the, the lessons learned that you've had and, and some thoughts you have on this? Sure. So I think it's been really interesting, you know, setting aside not entirely the, the last 16 months that you know, all these major platforms, whether it's, you know, Microsoft or Google, they're, they're really building up these kind of platforms that do a little bit of everything. But I think that we're increasingly seeing that organizations aren't necessarily keen on just living in those platforms. You know, they want to use what we describe as kind of the, the best of breed, the best in class uh, workplace applications. And those often go beyond the bounds of those nice, neat little boxes. And that can be tough. You know, that can be really difficult from an organizational standpoint when you think about, uh, you know, where that data, data is going to live. Does it have the same robust capabilities that, say, Microsoft 365 does when it comes to e-discovery and things to that effect? Um, but it's also a challenge in the sense that, you know, when you think about not just the organizations making these decisions, but, you know, it, Slack is a great example of it's so easy to just start up a free instance of these things. You know, employees are going rogue. You know, and they don't think of themselves as going rogue, but they've got a job to do. And there's a tool in front of them that, say, that says they can do it. So it's interesting to see how organizations are kind of facing off against these challenges. Yeah, I, just to tag on to, to Sean's point, I think one of the other challenges too with, with all of these great applications, right, is how to get the data out to solve for things like e-discovery or or you know, privacy or even just like data retention type of things. So 
you're limited sometimes by what a cloud provider will allow you to remove from it, like through an API and or what your technology may may be able to do to to, to pull that out or or archive it or replicate it or or make a forensic copy of it so that you could show that you've preserved it uh, the right way. So you you are limited at work and sometimes uh, by what what you can pass through in uh, that API. And then there are things like on on here, you know, like Office three sixty five and Teams, you know, tremendous growth and and really really powerful tools, but not everything is kind of built the same way, right? Like so. So Teams is, you know, just like an overlay over a bunch of different things. So you may be looking at a team chat and it's got a link to a document and here's a picture and here's another thing. And on the back end of that, the data from that message might be stored in four different places, you know, like parts of it. And, and understanding that goes a long way towards solving for, you know, what's the right way for me to capture that data and make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm solving for that. I, I know Sean, has, has gone through this uh, in, in, in depth, but you know, I think that's a, a great example of kind of like, where does the data really, I think it's right here in this message, but on the back end of this, it might be architected in two or three other repositories. It's true. No, and that's a huge challenge. It's something that I think we're, we're still coming up against every day. You pick up a rock and you find out that the rock actually leads to four different tunnels going to four different lakes. Right, right. Yeah, none of that is anything that makes any discovery professional very comfortable, I don't think. <laughs> so just to sum up on this section, um, just to ground this, prior to COVID, we were looking at about 10% of the workforce. And this, uh, actually, this um, these stats were from about a year ago, uh, just over in the fall of 2020. So this could be even higher, but, um, but with stay-at-home orders, looking at 65% of the workforce becoming remote. And, you know, just, you know, reiterating what Sean said uh, about the access, very easy to get up ap uh, applications, very easy to for employees to go rogue and doesn't mean they're going rogue and with negative intentions by any means. But, you know, I think where every everyone was scrambling to figure out their new world order and that involved finding new tools that we could use to help our work at home transition. So, you know, there's obviously now we've now we have to start getting our arms around all this and the implications of, you know, what all has everyone been doing, both with um, applications that IT is managing and controlling, and then the ones that that go beyond that. So, Andrew, I'll, just a quick I'm on, sorry. On, on, that, on that stat there, the 65% remote workforce piece, right? So, so of that 65%, it's gotta be like north of 90, almost 100% are knowledge workers. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so 65% yeah. of the total workforce, right? Like, so yeah. firefighters aren't like working in Slack at home and, you know, like a chef isn't, you know, ma making making uh, uh, dinner for people like in his house, like on, on Microsoft Teams, The six, that 65% of the total workforce, they're all on those applications that were on the slide before. So that that's really like, I don't want people to walk away going, oh, well, it's like two thirds of the country. Yeah, but of the two thirds, 100% of them are using these kind of applications to be productive. I mean, maybe it's 90 or whatever, but you know, it's way north of that, I think, you know, and that's sort of like kind of hidden in the the, the noise of, of like, like our, all these statistics is that, hey, this data is everywhere, you know, and, and, and it's not just, you know, I'm working from home, like I'm working from home on 10 different apps, right? So, yeah. So now that everybody's getting stressed, let's move into our common challenges. So e-discovery planning. So we tried, we wanted to look at this kind of from three main perspectives. Uh, obviously e-discovery, which is, you know, at the, at the heart of many of our roles and, and primary jobs day to day, but this dovetails, as everyone knows, this dovetails so much with both privacy concerns and, and information governance. And e-discovery really is, uh, is such a, a key foundation for, for so many other, other areas around, uh, other needs around privacy and information government, governance. So um, let's, let's start, the, start the discussion, I guess, around e-discovery and go from there around you know, what are we looking for and why? And, and uh, you know, we've touched on a number of these things. Um, is, you know, is there anything more here we, we you guys want to go into? 
I Scott mean, thing, oh sorry. sorry good. no no sean you go sorry i'm gonna no. now <laughs> yeah you, you got it sorry ball is in your ball is in your court my apologies not at all um you know i'll say that one of the big challenges that we faced as an organization i think that um it's a known quantity that government isn't necessarily the most agile when it comes to adopting new modes of technology you know email we've had decades to work out data retention policy we've had decades to figure out what you know what life cycle management is going to look like for these data types but you know overnight for many organizations my own included we're now introducing entirely new modes of communication like real-time collaboration whether it's slack or teams or what have you and so now one of the big challenges we're facing is really thinking through you know do we treat this like email uh, you know i know a lot of organizations for example have 30-day retention for emails in an inbox you know are we going to do the same thing for slack when there is no conceptual inbox, you know, so I think that those are kind of big questions that we have to start asking ourselves is, you know, is this data in the same way that, you know, ephemeral data exists when we say something out loud in the hallway, or is this something more akin to an official business record? Yeah, and I think to, to build on, on that too, when, when you look at these challenges, right, it, it, you can think about things like the EDRM model, right, that we we're all probably pretty familiar with, it's identification, it's collection, it's, there's some search pieces of that. A lot of the challenges here, and this is why I think to, to your point earlier on, Andrea, is how, where, where, what's the role for e-discovery professionals to play? Very steeped in like collecting data, classifying it, finding it, you know, and, and, and pointing people to it. Now that's all been around a litigation use case or an investigative use case, but these privacy and governance challenges are faced with the same process, right? I, I can't classify it. I can't apply a rule to it. I can't, you know, respond to a subject access request if I can't find it. Mm -hmm. and, and these tools and, and technologies that e-discovery folks work with um, and, and are, are experts in are designed to go and find that. So now the challenge is, where can I go and find it in all those applications that you talked about earlier, you know, and, and all these, these new, new data sources that we're using to work from home? And then can I do the right thing with it? Can I, can I solve for the privacy challenge? You know, can I, can I apply data retention to it so that I don't have it too much so that when there's a breach, like I've mitigated the risk or when, when there's discovery, I mitigated how much I need to collect and produce and pay to host and review downstream from that EDRM model. So I think that EDRM model is still a very valid, you know, construct for looking at all these new challenges because it's it's still the same stuff we've been doing. It's just that the data isn't like in some neat little box in a server closet downstairs anymore. It's now, you know, in, in a bunch of cloud applications, wherever the cloud may be, you know, in bigger data farms somewhere else that you don't know where they are. So if we still think about it in terms of like, what's our process to, to kind of, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time, I, I think we can run back to, to those things of like, we need to find it we need to understand what the data is, and then we need to take the right business action on it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there almost, would you almost say that there's another layer of responsibility that's emerging here? Um, in addition to identification, preservation, and collection, which is really like, and, and you know what, forever, the EDRM has been anchored or, or starting in, in that IG space, but, uh, but we all generally focus on the IPC. Um, would you say that there's now an enhanced almost responsibility for e-discovery professionals to start propagating out the findings to the business around and, and, and doing, doing due diligence, obviously, around the retention, but then, you know, obviously we have to respond to our events, but, but then what, and how else can this help? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go broad brush on, on, on this here, because I'm, I'm an old school information governance guy. They own policies and they're really adapt at, uh, uh, adept at, 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 Kind of working without any support, you know, of like trying to like affect change without like direct reports or budgets or you know those kind of things that people need to get 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 through through life, right? But they can bring stakeholders together and in, in, in to build a coalition. So if you look <laughs> to those information governance people, they they've already got a process on how can I get everybody in the room to like solve for these things. E-discovery folks have been much more tactical and have had the tools because you know there's we're defending the organization. Like if we, if we don't do that, you know, we might not be a business anymore or, or what have you. So they have had technology and tools and they've been fighting in the trenches to, to, to do that. I think, I think if you get those, those folks together, 
and realize, hey, we're solving for the same thing, just at like kind of different parts of the life cycle, bring your tools and technology to the information governance people who are already kind of plugging into, you know, like the business, how can we find information faster so that people are more productive, like that kind of, that kind of partnership and, and, and getting people around the table to be successful could be huge, you know? Yeah. You know, if I can build on that, I think Scott's absolutely right that you know, it's, it is about the, I would say that it's maybe not necessarily a responsibility for these e-discovery uh, wizards to become experts in all these new areas. Uh, but I think it's contingent upon them to start to lay the foundation for better communication across the business. Hmm. You know, I think that that's something that has been true well before cloud, but is more relevant now more so than ever, you know, whether it's, on the procurement side of things, you know, especially with kind of this explosion of software as a service, cloud-based, um, one of the big challenges to echo something that Scott said, it's not a, a, a data closet in the basement anymore where your data lives. It's now not just gated behind the cloud of a, a software as a service company, but it's also potentially gated behind the tier of one of their plans. You know, it's not going to be your, your free tier where you're going to get e-discovery capabilities. It's not going to be the step up that's going to give you your e-discovery capabilities. It's going to be your enterprise class. And I don't think necessarily, you know, off the cuff, IT teams are thinking about that kind of stuff. So having that engagement, that communication across the business is going to be super important well beyond the bounds of just responding to events. Yeah, I, I think that the takeaway here is like, you, you just can't have a parochial outlook of like, I'm, I do e-discovery and the privacy guy will do the privacy stuff and the the governance team will, will worry about data retention. You know, if, if you don't work together, th these things will keep poking you in the eye, like across the board. Like, so if you don't know where it is, then the company is gonna have to pay for like, you know, privacy related issues or in the security team wants to know where things are because they're defending the threats against, against this very data. So there's, th there are people here that are all working towards the same goal. And you would be more efficient if you work together versus just thinking like your slice of the pizza is the entire pizza, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, obviously e-discovery is very much a reactive sort of, a, like you said, tactical reactive event response, but, you know, taking, you know, in, in tying into what you said earlier too, about lack of change management, you know, looking at how, how can you integrate that sort of a post-mortem process that can then, you know, enable some of that better collaboration with IG, compliance, legal groups within the organization to look at the findings. And, and you know, there may, and there may be, there's often too, like nuggets for, a, for the start of a business case in that post-mortem as well. So lots more, lots more planning opportunity. Um, with respect to privacy, have you seen, um, have you, ha, do you have some thoughts on, on how sort of privacy is, is, is that an enhanced, is there more risk to the organizations around privacy with, with these new tools that are being used? And, and uh, do you have some thoughts on, on where that's going? I'll, 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 I'll jump in and then let Sean, you know, kind of, kind of go on this. There's definitely more risk with more of these applications that there's more places to look for. There's more places to go and classify all that stuff. Um, I, I think the, 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 the thing that you have to think about is again, to, to that IT rolled out a bunch of tools to, to, to support people, right? Like I think a year and a half ago, like the number of Microsoft Teams users was like 15 million. <laughs> and it's 148 million now. So obviously we skipped some change management steps when that rolled out, right? So what we didn't think about was like what data shouldn't go into these platforms or if data has to go into that platform, can we apply governance to it? Can we put rules on it? Can we map to the data, like what our policies are that we spend a lot of time. There's a whole compliance team in your organization somewhere that's that's working really hard on policies and, and what have you. and they probably weren't at the table when the technology was selected and rolled out. And so we have to get that, that joined up. Like, I mean, the, these are just, this isn't just the cart in front of the horse. This is like a bunch of carts rolling downhill and the horses are still standing at the top. So like, yeah. we need to get everybody in the room to like, to solve for this. And we're all smart people. We, we, we all kind of get the problem. We, 
but this isn't a technology solution and I, I sell technology. So that's a silly thing for me to say, but if you don't get the people together to agree on what the course of action is and what we want to do, technology is never going to be able to solve for it. Right. Like, and, and, and that's, what's making the problem worse. And so whether it's for privacy and you can't go and like, should there be PII data in there? Is it anonymized? Like, is it masked? Is it, you know, do we have government strings there? Did you know people can store stuff like this? This used to be the thing that I would run into in house um, with, with people backing up their laptops to like Windows file servers. And then we're getting like vacation photos and their tax returns and all kinds of stuff that, that nobody thinks about. They're like, oh, this is just my, this is my folder. Like, okay, yeah, but we back that up on the servers and there are backup tapes of your tax returns and your kids' pictures, and we don't want that. So like the risk to the organization grows and, and there isn't sunlight on that. So we need to like kind of get the people and the policy piece on there of what should be in the platform in the first place. And then you can start to solve for like, you know, do we know what's there and how can we address like the things like that are reactive, like subject access requests and, you know, data breaches and, 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 and notifications. So I, I know Sean, you, you, you've grappled with this stuff too before, like, so, it, you know, I absolutely want your, your, your input here on like, certainly the shadow IT piece, you, you must see that like, like, not stop, right. Yeah. yeah. You know, Tell I us think a war that, story. Tell us a war story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> no, not at all. I, you know, candidly, I think Slack was a bit of a war story. Uh, you know, when I came in almost four years ago, uh, the organization didn't have any sort of real-time collaboration platform. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of just operated on that assumption, a naive one, that, you know, people were using email uh, to communicate. And of course, you know, there was nascent Skype for Business installs on computers that nobody was advocating for. So when we did finally kind of get our heads on straight and think like, okay, we've got to, we've got to step up to the plate here and pick a tool. We went and explored and we partnered up with Slack and they were able to provide some really um, uh, troubling, I mean, troubling insight as to just how deeply these free instances had pervaded our organization. Now, of course, they're super privacy conscious. They don't tell you exactly who, but they can tell you to some degree, you know, this email extension is in a lot of places. So I think that that was an interesting kind of eye-opening experience too. Organizations have to be more agile with respect to the tools that they provide and how they respond to tools just kind of showing up. You know, I think one of the things that we're seeing here is that organizations are increasingly challenged to provide the tools that people are hungry for, whether the organization agrees with whether it's the best tool or not. You're like you have to try and meet that need somewhere. Um, there's a, when I worked in the training space, there was this really famous saying that, you know, if you close a door on a user, they're going to break the window. Uh, cause that's just how the game is played. They're trying to get their job done and they're trying to do it with the, the tool that helps them do their job, at least perceptibly. Um, one of the things that I want to come back to for just a quick second here was kind of building on what Scott had said about the, the policy and the people side of it here with respect to like privacy. And I think that that's a really, really good call out. But I think that there is that second piece to it here. Scott's 100% right that the policy has to come first. Organizations have to institutionally decide what they care about and how they're going to go after it. But then you do have to take it to the technology piece of it. You do have to identify whether these organizations, these platforms that you're using have the tools, have the capacity to help you moderate that. You know, Microsoft's done a really good job. Google's getting better. Um, Slack is starting to think about that. And so you really have to turn your attention to, you know, e-discovery platforms, you know, like my organization uses Ana, and, uh, and they are really starting to turn their eye towards identifying this PII and where it might be showing up. Everything's a platform now. So even if Slack isn't necessarily the place where you agreed, we're going to share this information, it plugs into Box, it plugs into Microsoft, it plugs into Asana where that data might live. And now it's in Slack. So these are big challenges to think about here. I think there's always like another new application. You just, you mentioned Asana, like Asana was one that, <laughs> that two years ago I, I'd never heard of, you know, and, and, and I, I use it all the time now. And it, it's, it's really remarkable how, how adept these new applications are and how quickly they, they kind of grow and people use. And because some of these are so cheap, you, you can't short circuit that sort of uh, IT sourcing kind of, you, you know, process so that only a couple of teams may be on a platform and they're using it and that it's not shadow it, it is shadow it but it's not shadow it in the same regard because 
somebody knows about. Like it's approved in a certain sense, but it it probably didn't go through your, your vetting process to come into the organization. Um, but again, the data doesn't live in your organization. These are all cloud hosted providers. So, you know, the knowing where your data is, is kind of key to being able to solve for any of these, you know, challenges here. And, and, and I think that's probably the important thing too, is, you know, you're, I, I'm not going to bang on about data mapping because that's always sort of like tilting at windmills. <laughs> right. But, but it, like, at least, at least know the applications that you have and, and what process they support. Like, why, why do we have that? You know, and then you can get into sort of the, the privacy by design and the policy pieces of that, of like, what data do we, we capture? What do we retain in these steps? And why do we have it? And then you can talk, get the, your governance team to start to go, well, here's how long we should hold on to it at this step and in this platform. And to Sean's point, knowing the capability of that technology to retain it, to delete it, to you know, report out on it is, is kind of the whole ball game at the end. You're not going to get there if you don't know like what it can do. So. I want to share a small tip that I have uh, uh, an executive friend of mine at BlackRock uh, goes by when it comes to trying to identify shadow IT within an organization is, you know, thankfully the, the consumerification of enterprise software, you know, like you see ads for this stuff. Now you're watching, you know, Stephen Colbert on YouTube and suddenly you're seeing a Monday.com ad. Anytime uh, he sees an ad for an enterprise software, he stops what he's doing, pauses the video, fires off an email to, you know, the CTO or the IT director, whomever, and says, Hey, can we do a check and see if anybody's using this anywhere? Just like starting that conversation as soon as it's starting to hit kind of the, the public airwaves, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's, that's an, that's an interesting uh, perspective that probably a lot of people haven't thought about before doing before. And, you know, of course, everybody's going to be walking away much more paranoid after this. So, uh, sorry, be, everybody that, that'll, it's okay. <laughs> we can't help our jobs are, our jobs are to be paranoid. Um, my, but, my, uh, tip, my tip on the, the black rack guy, I, I watch squawk on the street. And if they're starting to talk about like the stock price of one of these, these enterprise apps, I'm looking it up like, Hey, do, do we connect to this? And if not, why everybody's talking about this app, you know, which means it is proliferating somewhere. So, yeah. Yeah. Great. So while we spent quite a bit of time talking there, which was fantastic, uh, moving into the more formal discovery planning considerations, I'm not sure if we have anything left to talk about on this one because uh, we may have just covered it all. Um, so we've talked about, uh, and, and you know what, Scott, I actually, I thought what you, uh, what you said there around uh, data mapping and instead looking at sort of an inventory of what technologies and apps that you have as a starting point, because, because data mapping, while so logical, can be so challenging for so many organizations to kick off. So, you know, this really, I think this, that was such a great point around like looking at what applications that they have. And, um, and we've talked already a lot about the why. Let's maybe while we're here, touch a bit on access. Um, what do your, what do you guys think about uh, sort of the challenges that, because for every app and that especially with now that you've made us paranoid about all the other things that people are downloading and using, we've got access, a lot of rogue, rogue behaviors perhaps and rogue access rights. Um, and is, is access part of the sort of the policies? Do you feel these applications are, are have the tools in there to really manage, help administrators who are managing these tools really properly manage access? What's, what are your thoughts? I, I, I don't do as much security type of work as I, I used to, uh, but I, I certainly do a little bit more talking about kind of role-based um, access. And, and, and I think that's still probably like a good, a good lens to look through of like, you know, making sure that one, the employees and, and the users have the tools they need to be successful in their jobs is sort of like the, the role. Like it, this is, IT is an enabling function. So making sure they have the, the access to the data they need to be successful is, is pretty key. But that, that role base is also like your first security, like kind of line of defense, right? Internally to, to, to rogue actors. Like I, I won't talk about like kind of threat awareness and the outside stuff, but if, mm -hmm. if you don't need to get to 
applications, you shouldn't have access to it, right? I can, and if there isn't a reason, for, and that's why most, most organizations have sort of an internal approval process of like, hey, can I do that? Now that's also kind of budgeted too, right? Like, because you may only have X number of seat licenses for that application. So you're trying to manage a, a, a user population that's, that, that'll impact your, your pricing model. So I think that that's certainly a, a, a way to, to, you know, put some, some fencing around uh, are around your your first tier on 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 the access piece to solve for it. I think the second piece really is just making sure that you know and and this is from like when I, I used to do a little bit more privacy by design stuff of like really understanding why is that data there and then who 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 needs to touch it and what do they need to see in that data element like to to get to to that. Now that's more about making sure that you're not exposing data to people who don't see it, but it's the same use case to like solving for it from a security perspective. But I think Sean's a little closer to some of that stuff than, than, than I am. Yeah, you know, I think one of the, the big questions here isn't just who has access to it, but it's how long do they have access to it for? Yeah, you know, one, one of the things that I, I've seen work really well uh, is to really empower the business unit that owns that data or owns the access to e-discovery data to kind of cut the red tape, so to speak. And if they need to loop somebody in to streamline the process for them to be able to bring it in, because when you create these big hulking bureaucratic processes to give people access to that data when we need them, uh, people are a lot more reticent to drop that access when they're done. And so you just end up with this bigger and bigger pool of cooks in the kitchen, which is deeply problematic, particularly when you think about changing business roles, you know, the, the, just the nature of the business is people are changing jobs, even within an organization more often than ever before. So it's, it's streamlining process. And that doesn't necessarily feel like an e-discovery consideration until you consider the impacts that it has on e-discovery data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, definitely if you don't, you know, by not considering that, then, you know, it opens up the, uh, the sources so much more when you're pursuing custodians um, access and where they're working. So yeah, good considerations that we don't think about every day. Um, so now around review and analysis, um, you know, these, these, I think a lot of people are probably really uh, interested in hearing a bit more of the discussion around this, in this area, because um, certainly short form messaging is, is uh, a real big challenge. Um, and then also there's just a whole new, um, a whole new requirement around analytics and methods of review for these for these short form messages and, and other content. Also handling link content. Do you have any suggestions around these these items? So um, maybe Scott, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah. So uh, we run into this, you know, because our our platform is is designed to go into collaboration apps and cloud-based tools and, and go for this. So this is one of the reasons that people come to Ona, which is to, you know, can I get a Slack thread? Can I, can I get from, from uh, teams and can I, you know, go and, and get that? So, but that, not, not to make it a, a commercial about that, but that's sort of the challenge that, that people are faced with. So we always look for, you know, like, can you do things like who saw this thread? You know, like, you know, who, who was aware of that then? Who read this, this, you know, channel? Like, were, were they a participant and what dates did they join the channel and what dates? So it's, it's a little different. It lit these are literally like data streams. Like, when did somebody jump in the stream up river and did they still float down to this point? And, you know, like, who else was like in floating with them? And what did they talk about then? Like, and trying to gather that is really sort of the engineering challenge that that we're faced with to, to deal with this. So, um, it the problem gets magnified each and every time. Like, you like every one of those collaboration apps that we talked about. And I mentioned this early on from like an API perspective because you can't do e-discovery through through all of these the same way in a, in a collection perspective because you will be somewhat limited on what that collaboration tool will give you like what data do they maintain what can you what can you collect from it it is a little bit different than doing like just pulling emails from exchange like that that seems so easy i can't believe we complained about it 10 years ago now compared <laughs> to like 
you know, hey, I've got a sales team in, in South Africa using WeChat and can you like get their stuff? And then there's a Slack thread over here and who, who knew what, when, where, and why? Like that's a whole nother level of complexity that, that folks are, are grappling with. So we really try to like look at engineering that allows us to be flexible enough that per collaboration tool or per, per cloud-based tool that we can pull from that. But we are, we're gonna be limited just like anybody else that, that solves for this by what we can get from the, that, that application. It really does speak to the challenges of trying to, you know, Scott, to borrow your word, the, the thread of conversation as it ebbs and flows through these different collaborative platforms. You know, it's like trying to find the, your two socks in the dryer of clothes, you know, like you've got the one sock and you got to dig and you got to dig just to find the other one. So it is a substantial challenge. Um, I think one thing that, you know, we, we've touched on briefly here is understanding the historical record of context within that as well, because these are live documents because these are so and so often whether it's slack or teams live conversations that aren't just out there but they're editable they're deletable you know that historical record of context has a ton of value behind it and so it's not just is that data out there in the same way that it was when i just dumped something onto the network drive but it's also is this what it was when it was put on there is it this what it was when scott saw it when andrea saw it uh, and so that's going to be part of the conversation as well, you know, not to say anything about like emojis and what contextual relevance those have. Right. I, you know, I think, I think what the difference is now, if I really think about like sort of the, the life cycle of discovery from like my first e-discovery project was 2006, you know, so I'm, I'm old and I'm okay with that, but I mean, that was paper, like let's scan paper. And then like, let's, there were some emails that were on, on that. But what we're trying to capture now is really ephemeral. Like these are conversations. And certainly in the last year and, and a half or whatever it's, it's been now, it, where you would have had a conversation or we would have worked collaboratively in a, in a conference room and, and done stuff on a whiteboard, that's a Slack thread. That's a team's message. That's you know, that's a text. And we're capturing all of this data now when we didn't capture conversations the way we used to, like that's how we worked. Um, maybe maybe somebody had some handwritten notes or what have you that you you kind of like went to, to go for. But th that, was, that was a challenge because you didn't know if like somebody hand wrote it the day that it was. These are all time date stamped of when the message came from. So you're really kind of faced with like the fact that how people, we're memorializing like everything, every conversation, like this Zoom, for instance, like is being recorded. Hi, everyone. You know, and, and like the chats that people are putting in, that's being captured too. Like, so if, if there, there was a, you know, if this was like a shareholder meeting or something like that, the, could you get to this Zoom recording like and, and pull this out? Like, you know, if there was a shareholder lawsuit or something like that. So there's, there are things that we used to have conversations about that you didn't have to worry about, but now this is really kind of the, the piece too of not only can you go and capture it, but can you put it into a review platform? So, so the attorneys that your outside counsel or what have you can review it in such a way and mark it up and say, hey, this is responsive. Like that high five emoji said, yes, go do that thing. And, and I get it, you know, and, and we, should, we should investigate this further. So there's the context and of just, understanding how people talk and communicate now is so much different than three years ago, even, you know, so. Yeah. I think uh, Ilta should do a whole session on, uh, on emojis. Get depressed. Emoji ah, management. Really hard. Maybe we need an industry standard glossary for emojis. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, okay. So some considerations when establishing new policies. Um, yeah, I think we've talked about a number of things around this, but is, is there anything else that, uh, um, that you guys are feeling that we, we should touch on and add to this at this time that we haven't already? I mean, I think we, we touched on it earlier. I think access is an important part of the conversation. Codifying that is super important, you know, because yeah. I think that particularly with, you know, we, we talk about it 
it's on the news the the, the great resignation that for, you know the better part of 40 percent of the global workforce is considering changing jobs that means a lot of institutional knowledge is going out the window that means a lot of people who previously owned these responsibilities are going on to bigger and better things uh, or just different things so uh, codifying access so that as these roles are changing it's not well who normally has access to this you know, it's going to be really important yeah yeah and I think on the retention settings piece right like if your platform has a retention capability you know even if it's sort of a binary you know one year two year on and off whatever less is more when it comes to policies and 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 the the trend had been in like records retention to go to more of a big bucket type of thing like we're 20 years ago you might have 300 classifications for these things you can't you can't use that kind of classification schema with some of these tools. I mean, you, you, your, your retention is just like keep everything or keep nothing, you know, or like, or it's a rolling one year, two year, three year type of thing. So the more granular you are with your, your policy, the harder it is to implement. So I would just, you know, file that away of like, how can I get to reducing my data store in the most kind of effective but still legally and compliant way possible is probably the right fit, depending on your industry and your organization. Obviously, your mileage may vary, but it, you know, it, if you've got a very granular schedule and you're not in a regulated industry, I would question, is that the right approach? Because you're moving to these platforms and it's going to be very, very difficult for you to match that policy to where your data lives. You know, and to organizations that are thinking like, oh, we'll just wait it out until these tools are mature enough to do that. I don't think that's the option it was 10 years ago, yeah. you know, the, because what Slack is today is going to be something different in six years. Uh, you know, and so you, you just, you can't wait because your users are already getting there. So you do have to kind of think like, how do you meet users where they are while to Scott's point, staying in compliance. It might even be that in six months after Salesforce acquired them. So yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Um, I realized our conversation on that on our previous slide sort of was morphing into this slide. Yeah, yeah. To continue it, um, uh, I, I think this is right. I mean, like the, the, the it, it's it's multiple fold here, right? Like you've got some applications will be able to handle these things, like Office three sixty five with the compliance center. You can get granular if you wanted to, but the thing is, you can't take that and go to the other applications you have with it. You know, like like that tool won't manage other tools and the data and the other tools like so and there aren't really applications that are going to go into all of those different data stores and start to manage that from a policy perspective um, even data governance tools will get limited by you know going back up into the uh, into these other cloud applications so you can use you know some of these data governance tools to manage your data mart or your data lake or what have you and they can they can do a great job there, but they're going to be challenged by going to your Slack instance or what have you. So you're going to have to kind of balance the policy with like your ability to actually be compliant with your own policy. Like that that's that's probably the real challenge that that we're we're getting to. Sure, you know, and are 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 the policies written in a way that there's not an expectation that one person is going to be an expert in data exports for nine different software as a service platforms, you know, that's a huge challenge. You know, it was not, you know, I think 10 years ago it was, can you export out of exchange? Great. You got the job, but now are we expecting these users to step up to the plate or these, you know, these uh, e-discovery experts to step up to the plate and become experts in, you know, exporting from Slack, exporting from box, what have you, uh, or are we going to turn our attention towards, you know, these third-party e-discovery platforms that we can ostensibly treat as truth, you know, that single point of entry, that single pane of glass for all that information. And are you going to use that as the, the path forward when it comes to making future procurement decisions? So uh, just moving into our closing considerations and then getting into some Q&A, we've got about 10 minutes. Um, We've talked about uh, the line, the need for line of sight, uh, clear line of sight, and uh, you had said about, um, you know, 
looking not just under the rock, but where where all the other tunnels are going to lead to beyond just that initial source that you're looking for. Um, the retention policies uh, and um, maybe actually maybe we could go a little bit more around um, some options around analytics and data enrichment like and review tools like have you you know I think a lot of our audience is, is probably heavily using relativity and relativity analytics um, as well for review um, do you have some do you have some ideas around some of the solutions that uh, that that you're seeing integrate with relativity Well, now, my so organization as, doesn't have a ton of insight on that one, so I'll defer to Scott if he's got okay. anything. Yeah, I mean, we, we're we we don't do review platforms our, ourselves, but we do export to them, right? Like so, okay. and, and and we do have a, a we are an open platform in the sense that people can build uh, processes and stuff like that. So, like we have one right now with Supproved where they're building one, uh, uh, you know, right to their platform from from our data source. So we have customers who come to us saying like, hey, great, great job finding all that data. We need to get it to the review platform. Um, so we're we're very open to making sure that we can get stuff to a place where people can find the data and make the right decisions on it. And we kind of tear down any of the barriers that there may be. And I think that's probably the, the best way for the industry to go. Um, and, and I think we have a, we had a point about this earlier about kind of, and Sean mentioned this sort of like the best of breed kind of application approach. We don't believe in trying to like do every aspect of like the EDRM model or like what have you, like we're going to stay in our, in our couple of buckets and we're going to do those buckets really, really well. Um, and I think what happens is if you can, you know, for the folks who are in house and you're looking at your, your kind of tech stack to solve for these problems, making sure that you've got the right tools for those different parts. Like, can you find the data? Can you analyze the data? Can you, you know, like number three here, can we do data enrichment to solve for a different use case? You know, like your the business might like data enrichment because that might help them solve and for search and find data so that they can be more productive faster. Um, and then can you get it into another platform, be it for analytics so that you can, you know, like what, what data do we have on our customers? You know, and, and your marketing team might want to know that kind of stuff. You might want to be able to just export it to solve for review. But I think this kind of like, there are pivot points here in numbers three and four that will allow folks who just do e-discovery to bring value back to your, your business partners and, and to bring value back to other aspects of like, you know, your IT department that, that focus on data analytics and focus on, you know, can we do data enrichment so that people can get to that data faster? Your governance team would love to do data enrichment because they can map that classification number two, those retention policies to those, those data tags to like then put the right, you know, kind of disposition timelines on, on the data. So you're not then maybe overproducing in number four again. So these things aren't disparate points. They're, there's linkages throughout here. And if you take a strategic view, if you come up just like one level and you see the, the connectivity here between, between where you can go with the data, there's a lot of great ways for you to be a proactive strategist for your organization here and, and, and bring value back to, to that group. And you know, one thing I'll just toss in there is, you know, I think the, the, the smaller your organization is, the more important it is to have that, that third party e-discovery platform, I think. Yeah, I think the reality is there's just not enough resources in those kinds of organizations to kind of roll your own in all these different spaces. And so that can be deeply invaluable when it comes to pulling in the sources, providing context, uh, and ultimately packaging it up in a way that you can either hand to your, if you're small, if you're big enough to your in-house counsel, or to hand it off to the partners that you're working with uh, for discovering. Great. Uh, so Q and A. So I would encourage anyone to uh, to submit um, to submit any questions via the Q and A button uh, capability, or if you prefer through the chat. I've got a, a question to kick us off, if you don't mind, Andrea. Go for it, Sean. You know, I, this is for all of us here. Uh, the, the question I've got is, you know, we talked about a lot of doom and gloom. Uh, with respect to, you know, kind of being proactive and 
how, you know, it's always going to be one step ahead. So we have to be one step ahead of that. Uh, what are you optimistic about in the space of e-discovering? Can I geek out on that first? Please. And then, then you two can like bring it home. But, <laughs> uh, I've got to say that um, I think there's so many interesting adjacencies to our traditional e-discovery that I've, I think that um, it's, it's really exciting to see the opportunities that are opening up for this industry and for people who have been, you know, who have acquired so much great tacit knowledge. You know, there's such a, you know, there's this brilliant comfort zone that e-discovery professionals have with messy, messy data that is really, I think, needed in other areas like IG and compliance and privacy. And there's so many other problems to solve leveraging our expertise of the technologies that we use and the, the emerging technologies that we're so able to easily adapt to and, and use. And then also just our comfort level with the, with the data sets and, and developing the processes and workflows that integrate the best of the technology with the, with the problems that the data is, is, is providing and and I just I think it's really exciting to see our industry have so much potential other relevant uses other than firefighting which you know I'm not dismissing the reactive the importance of the reactive e-discovery um, role in, in resolving legal events and whatnot but I think it's to be able to sort of start to move over and to be able to be a proactive contributor to, for your clients or for your organization is really exciting and opens up a lot of opportunity for a lot of people that, to make a lot of difference, a lot of really positive and needed difference. So, I think you might have single-handedly just completely pulled us out of the red and into the positive, Andrea. <laughs> There's my hand emoji, my ephoral emoji. For and my hand, my high five. Nice. <laughs> oh my gosh, like... we just did a virtual high five. That was hey, a first. Sixteen months. I'll take it. Did. I'll take it. <laughs> All right, Scott, your turn. Yeah, I, I, I think the the thing to remember for all of you that are that are on the the call is that you're incredibly well placed with your understanding of e-discovery tools and this kind of process and, and how to find data to solve for a bunch of different use cases for your organization. So wherever you wanna drive your career, if you wanna go down the privacy path, if you wanna go into governance or compliance or, or, or data enrichment and search and, and those type of things, your understanding of how to go and find information is critical to that and, and puts you like a light jump ahead of everybody else, right? So being able to kind of build on that to then do the next step. Am I enriching data to mark it up for litigation? Am I enriching data so that, you know, my, my colleagues can, can go and find information and, and we, we build better widgets faster. Like that's, that's nothing to sneeze at. I, I think, you know, if we're all very reactive in this space, cause it's, you know, UV, the other guy in, 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 in court, and you're, you're worried about those cases, but, what you're doing is is going through that EDR model and you're finding that data and, and, and moving it along, but take it up a step to those other use cases and you can pivot into any of those, you know, career kind of areas or even not even just career, it's just drive additional value for your, for your company and, and or, or your, your organization. And that's tremendous. Uh, so don't, don't lose sight of that, you know, like, like it's, it's a tremendous service that you're providing and, and your professionalism and, and education in this space, you know, like stand out that way. That's great. We had, we did have a question come in as well. Um, can you, uh, can you provide a few um, must reading material recommend, must reading materials recommendations uh, for the audience. I've, I've got one that's, it's not, you know, I think you'd be hard pressed to find, uh, you know, a, a bestseller on the topic of e-discovery specifically, but um, I think that Cal Newport had a good book that just came out a couple months ago called A World Without Email, uh, Reimagining Work in an Age of Communication Overload. And I think that it provides some really, really great insights, both on where we are today, some of the challenges we're facing with kind of information proliferation, and more importantly, kind of how the organizations can move forward to kind of 
stem the flow a little bit. I think it provides a lot of insight about where we are as an organization with, res with respect to information overload. Uh, so I highly recommend it. Uh, yeah, less less a, a, a book, but the, the Decade of Discovery was a documentary that came out um, and, and uh, like two, three years ago, maybe at this point, you know, certainly worth, worth a view, like if you can give 45 minutes to it. Um, as far as, you know, you know, other books uh, for any of these kind of areas, like the uh, IAPP puts out a, a, a couple of really great privacy, you know, uh, handbooks. Um, ACIDS obviously is a great resource. So I'm, I'm telling you like where to go and look more so than a specific thing. Um, uh, ACIDS has some great resources for e-discovery stuff. And uh, if you're in the governance side, I, I would look at ARMA. ARMA has a lot of like books. That, in fact, they have an online library that they they sell. I mean, I, I, I've got like law and records management around here, like, you know, the, the cases in like a leather bound. It, they're basically all the, 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 the law cases that have precedents that said something about record retention and records management that, you know, like, here's why we have to do it this way. You know, like, so those are all kind of like good resources to go and find additional resources. That's great. Thank you guys. I love it. Some all right. books, some documentaries, some online resources. Lots of lots of places for food for thought. Um, we're at time now, so uh, I just want to thank you both uh, for such a great discussion and conversation. And um, thanks to Ona for sponsoring this and and having us as part join you in this, Scott. This has been really fun and really appreciate this. Did either of you have any other closing comments you want to make? Uh, I can't wait for the border to, to be opened up again so I can get back up there. Uh, you know. Us too. Yeah. Us too. Uh, look, looking forward to it. I haven't been to Toronto in a couple of years. So i uh, looking forward to getting up there and, and seeing everyone in person again soon. Yeah, that's yeah, great. This has been a genuine pleasure. I appreciate you having me. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you to ACEDS for, for, for giving us this platform and for everyone joining us today. All right. All right. Can you provide copies? Uh, yeah, I think that's on the site. Oh. Oh. Sorry. I think we're.